In this video, we will learn about some of the common design patterns of recurrent neural networks that are used for various tasks. So let's dive right in. Recurrent neural network design patterns. One important design pattern is to have a network that has at every time step an output. We have an output O here at each time step. And we have a recurrence in the network between the hidden units. So we go from one hidden unit H to the next. And you can see the update equations here on the left. Here we have an old state of hidden unit H that is multiplied now by the recurrence weights W and we have our input x, which is given at time step t. Now this is multiplied by the input weights u. So we denote the resulting quantity as a in time step e. Now, as the resulting a is then passed through a nonlinearity such as tan h activation function to then yield our hidden state h of t. So this hidden state is then multiplied with some output weights v and its own bias term c to yield the output o in time step t. Finally, we apply our softmax function to get the prediction y hat as you see here in the output and this is the output basically. So this is then trained with back propagation through time, as you see here. So we have these shared weights over different um, time step. The shared weights are denoted as the same W across time. And because we are applying the same network to each input at each time step, we perform back propagation now in this entire computational graph, which means that we have losses at each time step L. So these Ls are the losses. And then we have labels also at each time step Y here. So the output and the labels go into then this loss function L. And we backprop through this whole chain that you see here. So because the output here depends on the input and the hidden state H here. So if you want to adjust our input weights u, and then we have to compute what the partial derivative of the loss with respect to h that we had is, and then we compute the gradient u. And we also have to go through from here and here. And as we go through time, we have to consider longer and longer change because any of these inputs in the past might potentially have contributed to the outputs that we have in the current time step. You can see another variant of the ordinary architecture here in this slide. Here, we don't have the recurrence from the hidden units in one time step to the next, but rather here we have the recurrence from the outputs back to the hidden units here. So this might potentially not capture the long-term dependencies in the input. And this is primarily because we used to go from hidden units to the outputs and you reduce the information flow to a few output units. And we do this in order to give the classification output, for example. So whereas the hidden units have much richer representations as they have more units, this can capture more information. Now, the nice thing about this is that the recurrence from the output to the hidden units is that you don't have to do back prop through time. So the hidden units only depend on the previous outputs, but they are independent of the previous hidden units themselves. So this way you could train the model using a method that we call as feature forcing. And you could do both teacher forcing and backprop through time together. And you'll see that some networks also do this.
So now in teacher forcing, you basically just process each input individually and make a prediction at a particular time step. You also have a label Y, as you see here, in each time step. And for the next time step, you just take whatever label you had in the previous time step, and that goes into the hidden units in the next time step. And this gives the model the exact correct information for the next time step, because this compares this with the label that you then get with the loss function. So what I just described happens during training, whereas while in testing, you then take the predictions or the output made by the model from one time step here, which is O, and then we feed this to the hidden units in the next time step. So the problem with teacher forcing is that when you hallucinate forward in time, you take whatever you predicted before to the hidden units in the next time step. And again, you make a prediction based on your previous prediction. Then you can start to accumulate these errors because you make some errors in one time step and then it carries over to the next time step and so on. And then at some point, this will lead to outputs to become very far from the training distribution and in turn become unstable. But the nice thing here is that the training is much easier in this case. So another architecture is shown here where you have varying sequences of input X, which is then fed into the hidden units. These are now recurrently connected as you can see here. Now you compute this output O with label Y using the loss function L as you see here. So we saw an example of this using the sentiment classification, but you would have a structure similar to this structure that we see here in this slide. And because you have the recurrence in the hidden units, you have to train with backpropagation through time. And we do this in order to capture the long-term dependencies in the signal. Here we see an architecture of modeling a sequence that is conditioned on context. This is the case uh, with image captioning example that we saw before. So we have an input here, for example, X, which is an image which is then fed into a network at time step T. Now a model creates the words depicting whatever content here that it sees in this image. So here you feed the label Y here into the hidden state at each time step in order to influence the prediction at the next time step. So as you can see here at each instance, we, put, we give the input label Y, which influences the hidden units at the next time step. Now we see a similar architecture to the last slide, but in this one, you have the variable length of input sequence X here. And in the previous one, we only had a fixed length of X. So this would be an example for video frame classification, as we saw before, where you have an input video with many frames, and we want to classify each of these frames into some specific classification. Another really interesting architecture that is used is the so-called bidirectional recurrent neural network. Here you have two streams of recurrence, one that flows from the future to the past, and another one here that flows from the past to the future here. This of course cannot be used for online applications such as in the case of robotics. And this is because robots often get the data on the fly and you don't have the future sensor data, for example. But if you have all the data the sensor already has, at each time step, then you want to make the predictions using all the data that you have. So this is the model that can be used to summarize the data from the past and from what will come next in the future. And you want to use both of these data to make the final prediction. Note that you can only use this if you already have the information 
from the future in the given time step. This can be, for example, in the case that you have recorded a video already, or if you have recorded speech data already, and you are performing this processing on this entire speech data. So in this case, bidirectional RNNs are really useful. Okay, so finally, what you see here is the encoder decoder architecture. And this is mostly used in machine translation applications. So here you have a variable length of input X that goes into the encoder with different hidden units. And the last unit here, this unit is called as the context unit, which is again replicated here as C. So this context unit is now input to the decoder. So of course you can have the information from the previous step of the prediction in the decoder that is going into the next hidden unit here. So if we take an example of translation from English to German, then this context C summarizes everything that comes from the language English from the input sequence, which is then given to the decoder to output some other language. And here you also want to influence the predictions at each step, the next prediction that the network is going to make. That's why you have these arrows that are feeding from the previous output to the next time steps hidden unit. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this video. I have two questions for you. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of training using teacher forcing? And can we use bidirectional RNNs for handwriting recognition tasks? I encourage you to pause this video at this point and try to answer these questions. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you.